Hello, everybody, and welcome to the brand new 2015 season of the Hubble Hangouts. Uh, my name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and we are back from our meetings and all of our other stuff, and this is our first back to our normally scheduled hangout. And so we're, we're glad you're back. We hope you had good, good holidays and got all that out of your system. And Carol and I just got back from the... Uh, uh, 225th meeting of the American Astronomical Society. And Carol, do you know that we did 11 hangouts in like four days or something like that? It was like that crazy. was exhausting. It was amazing, though. Yeah, so we're still kind of decompressing from all of that, but we have a great hangout plan for you today. We have uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Massimo Stiavelli. He's the JWST mission head at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and he is going to tell us a lot about the early universe, the first stars, the first galaxies, and uh, and we're going to learn all about what this, this sort of interesting time in, in the history of the universe was like. And so, uh, well, but before we get to the discussion, let me uh, welcome, let me say hi to Scott. Scott, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Tony. It's How good are to you? See, it's good to see you again. I'm glad you're back. So, good to see you too. Good. So, um, one of the things that 2015 is bringing in for us is it marks the 25th anniversary, and I'm sure you've heard us say this already, of the Hubble Space Telescope being in orbit, 25 years. And so throughout the year, uh, we at the Institute have got a lot of different things planned, a lot of content we're going to be creating, some special hangouts we're going to be doing. But if you want to follow along on what what is going to be planned and where it's going to be and when and all of that kind of stuff, we have set up a website. It's called Hubble 25th dot org. Don't forget the th part. That's that's important. It's h u b b l e two five t h dot o r g. So we hope you'll visit that site. That's where we're going to post all the. That'll be the centerpiece around which all, we we make sure all the information gets disseminated and put out to people. So we hope you'll check that website out and let us know if um, if you have any uh, uh, comments or questions or things like that. Now. One of the things I wanted to do, Carol and I are currently putting together the list of Hangouts for this year, and I would like to call, uh, shout out to you guys. Let us know if you've got any ideas for Hangouts you would like to see in the coming year so that Carol and I can take that into, into consideration when we, uh, when we do the scheduling, because we'd like to hear from you. We want to make sure that you're getting the most out of these Hangouts as possible. So if you tweet out your ideas using the Hubble Hangout hashtag, uh, we will see it, and Carol and I will talk about it and see if we can make it happen for you. So we hope you'll do that. Which brings me to, finally, interacting with us on this Hangout. Hubble Hangout hashtag, that's the easiest way. You can tweet on that. Uh, you also can uh, leave us questions and comments at the Q&A app. I'm already seeing a couple here. You can also leave some comments on the YouTube page, and we're monitoring all of that, and we'll bring them up as the uh, as the conversation progresses and if it's relevant to what Massimo is talking about I will uh, I'll bring it up so without any more ado let's get started with me today as I said is Dr. Massimo Stiavelli he's the JWST mission head hi Massimo welcome and thanks for coming greetings everyone my pleasure <laughs> good so you tell us a little bit about uh, one of your big research interests and one of the things I love talking with you about is this period in the early universe uh, where first stars and galaxies formed. Give us some idea. Can you tell us, first of all, what do we mean when we're, is there a specific range of dates or times when we say the early universe, or is it just a very nebulous concept? What is the yeah, early universe? So to speak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit of a... Oh, I was punny right there. I didn't... Yeah, you were. You were punny. Oh, I didn't, didn't even know notice. That. I didn't even it's notice. It's a little bit nebulous. Um, <laughs> you know, some people would split it between the very early universe and the early universe even. But roughly speaking, uh, as you go back in time, uh, you get to the point where the universe looks very different from what looks around us today. And, you know, how very different is a, a little bit of a matter of personal taste. But uh, roughly speaking, I would say if you get to a point where you don't have any galaxy around, uh, you could call it early universe. And uh, before that time, you have a number of events. You know, you have the formation of the first stars. You have uh, a number of phenomena that, you know, happen very early after the Big Bang, including, you know, that rapid expansion of the universe that uh, we call inflation. Uh, so the, the essentially inflation to the formation of the first stars, could, of the first galaxies, could be a good definition of early universe. Okay. Uh, the um, so you, I want to. One of the reasons, and this is a hard question for me to ask in a way that <laughs> would make any sense. But what I'm trying to get at is, how is it 
that we can see back in time. Do you understand the question? How is it that when we look at the when we look up with powerful telescopes in space, we're actually seeing these these pa this past period of the universe. What makes that possible? Well, that's uh, it's the combination of the huge size of the universe and the finite speed of light. You know, when I look around in my room or even across the street from the window, I don't notice that the, the, the speed of light is finite because the distance is very small. But in fact, when I see somebody walking down the stairs in the building in front of me, uh, you know, I'm not seeing them now. I'm seeing them, you know, some microseconds or fraction of a microseconds ago when they were going down the stairs. So the difference is not important uh, for many part practical purposes. But once you go uh, and look at galaxies and this more and more distant galaxies, their distance is so large that the travel, the light travel time is actually important. And so you, you see these objects uh, in the past. We see the sun as it was eight minutes ago. And uh, and we see you know the nearest big galaxy uh, as it was uh, you know two million years ago and 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 it gets uh, more and more remote as we go to more distant objects. I, that that to me has always been a great consequence of the finite speed of light. I mean it's one of the things that the universe is so large and it's been around for so long that you know we keep seeing um, uh, further back uh, the the. the dimmer the objects are, the further away they are, the, the further back in time we are seeing them because it took, it took a certain amount of time for that light to get here. Now, do, how does, let's talk a little bit about the size of the universe. You mentioned already there was a period where the universe went through a rapid expansion. I'm presuming you're talking about inflation at that point, but yes. this is a period after inflation that, we're, that you're interested in, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so the universe we all know is expanding and it's accelerating as it does so, uh, which implies that it's been in the past it has been smaller. So in this period that we're talking about, this early universe period, how big was the universe roughly? Well, the um, there are two sides to that question. One is that we don't really know how large the universe is because we have a horizon. We have and the horizon is set by what is the most distant point in the or sphere in the universe that is distant enough and still allows enough time for light to get to us. Uh, there could be parts that are even more distant than, than that, and we that's just the observable. Have, the yeah, and that's the observable universe. Mm -hmm. So uh, what happens beyond that can be defined by mathematical models, but is not observable. Uh, we think that inflation uh, will actually grow the universe from a from a tiny little speck to something which is much larger than our observable universe. So there there, there, is, there is a lot beyond our horizon, uh, at least based on our current models and understanding. So for all practical purposes, the, the point beyond the observable universe is not really relevant to us in any way because we can't really get any information from it uh, since we're bound by the speed of light, correct? Yeah, and uh, whether we will see something or not depends as to do also with the degree of acceleration of the universe. Uh, because in a, in a universe that was uh, decelerating, we would be uh, seeing more and more of the universe as time goes on. But if it accelerates, actually, that's not the case. That's a good point, actually. It's, it, it, we, it's not necessarily a linear thing. With the further back in time, you know, could have, or, you know, let's say half of the universe's age before, the rate at which the universe was expanding could have been different than what we're seeing now. So there, there could be, and we don't know the answer, like you said, uh, the rates of expansion could have been different throughout different points in the history of the universe. So, um, you know, that's that's an important point to consider. And yeah. of course, dark, dark energy, they're saying, uh, which is a, another topic we won't go into right now, is one of the, the is, is supposedly responsible for some of this acceleration. So let's get, let's get to the stars and the first stars and galaxies themselves. So set the stage for us. What's the conditions of the universe for the first stars to form. And what so, came first? Stars came first, presumably, and then galaxies, right? Yeah, so uh, after the Big Bang, uh, the universe expands and cools down. And uh, and at some point, uh, uh, we, 
we use a quantity called redshift that is essentially uh, has to do with the ratio of the size of the universe, the, 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 the scale length of the universe today and at the time that we are looking at. So when I, and it's for simplicity, we define it with a one plus z. So yeah, for when I talk right? about, <laughs> yeah, everybody when understands I, what we're talking about. Yeah. So when we talk about redshift nine, we are talking about the universe that was ten times small, one plus nine, ten times smaller than it is today. At redshift ninety nine, it was one hundred times smaller than it is today. Bravo. So that outstanding explanation, by the way. That's the best explanation for risk I've, I've heard so far. <laughs> so at the redshift of around 1300, uh, the universe got cold enough that uh, hydrogen, which is the most common element that was ionized, separated in protons and electrons, recombines, and the universe becomes neutral. Now radiation, uh, the, the photons, uh, interact strongly with electrons. Once those electrons make it back to, to an atom of hydrogen, uh, the interaction of, of, the, of light and radiation and atoms become much less good. And as a result, we have effectively a decoupling between the radiation and matter. And that's the epoch when the cosmic microwave background radiation is released. Of course, at Reshi 1300, it was not cosmi microwaves, it was actually light, right. because uh, the wavelength of light also scales like the redshift. So the, the wavelength of light at redshift 1300 was 1,300 times smaller than it is today. So, so what was uh, microwave, what we now see as microwave was infrared and visible radiation. Mm -hmm. so, so that that is a milestone in the universe, and once matter is uh, is neutral, uh, it, it can uh, cool down even further. At the same time, dark matter uh, was starting to feel the pull of gravity. The universe was not absolutely uniform; it had little inhomogeneities, which are in fact the things that you see in the in the sky maps from uh, cosmic microwave satellites like WMAP. And those little fluctuations of density uh, start collapsing because something. Maybe, that maybe Scott, could you find us a W map or something image at, at some point? Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, think I, I've got some. I've got oh, some got, in here. Let oh, you got some? Okay. Here. All right, cool. Sorry, go ahead, Master. Uh, if you have it, maybe we could show it right now and then go okay. to the first movie. Uh, otherwise, we can just go to the first movie. So those there, there'll be. Oh. Which so the little over dense, uh, uh, yeah, the, I believe that the red uh, spots are places that are ever so slightly, like one part in 100,000, more dense than the rest, uh, and, the, and the blue parts are less dense than the rest. So the things that are more dense will tend to, um, to grow because of the attractive nature of gravity. And, uh, and so that's the seeds from which the first structures in the universe are formed. And this and is a snapshot of the decoupling you were talking about. When yeah, photons that's a snapshot were exactly of that time when uh, what radiation was doing and what the <coughs> matter was doing were the same. After that, the two get decoupled and radiations carry the same signal while matter starts collapsing. Okay. So if we could go to the first movie, that shows a, a numerical simulation of how those um, little density perturbations grow. And this is just a snippet for, from, uh, from one of the large simulation efforts that people do these days. Uh, you know, it's called the illustrious simulation. Oh, yes. We've seen this. It's beautiful. And, uh, and so you start from a more or less uniform uh, background and things start co uh, coalescing to form filaments and... Uh, now these filaments, are these are, what are they? Stars uh, or galaxies? Uh, so in the simulation, this is just dark matter. Oh, okay. And, but hydrogen, uh, once it's released from, uh, from its equilibrium with radiation, can actually falls in these gravitational potential wells defined by, grand ma by dark matter. So it falls in and starts forming structures. 
So uh, one important thing is that that simulation describes what we call cold dark matter. Cold dark matter is the prevailing theory these days and, and uh, essentially is the idea that dark matter has structure down to very low masses. So some of those first structures uh, have the mass of the Earth or the Sun and, and dwarf galaxies and big galaxies and you and it's a bottoms up model. So you first form the very small structures and then they merge together to form bigger and bigger objects. And so uh, for instance, today in the universe, this is the time when clusters of galaxies form. A lot of the smaller structures have already formed. So, okay. uh, so the so the that issue, sets the stage for the future, basically the shape of everything yeah. that's going to follow. Yes, but the reason I was making this distinction about cold dark matter is that even though most people believe that dark matter is in the form of cold dark matter that has also these very small components, we actually don't know for sure. And uh, there is actually a small parameter space uh, free as the opportunity not ruled out by present experiments that dark matter could be warm. Uh, that is made of particles that are a little bit less massive and so they were moving faster. And by moving faster they have smoothed out some of these smaller structures. And so the, the, the figure that, that I have uh, that compares uh, from a recent paper, the a simulation done with cold dark matter and one done with w warm dark matter shows what I'm what I'm talking about. Okay, so let me just make sure I understand the difference here. So cold dark matter is is a slightly larger. Uh, it's massive particles, so they were massive. they were moving slower. Moving slower, as opposed to warm dark matter, which is slightly smaller particles that can move faster. Yes, and so okay. the, the slower particles can form very low mass structures while the faster particles smooth out structure and, uh, and you end up with only somewhat larger structures. So if we could oh, see the figure... Okay. So that's why, uh, that's why that distinction is important. It'll have a, an effect on what we see, the shape. The, the, the large scales are very similar in the two, but the, the cold dark matter one has a lot of graininess and okay. those are very small halos of dark matter around 10 to the 6 solar masses, a million solar masses or 100,000 to a million solar masses uh, that are essentially absent in, in warm dark matter. Okay, uh, Scott, do you know that figure he's, he's referring to? Okay, do, can you put that up? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, so I believe uh, the left is the is the cold dark matter scenario, and okay. the, and the right is the warm dark matter simulation. So sure, I see what you mean. There's it looks a little smoother, smoothed yeah, out on the right. So the warm is smoother. Yeah. But the reason why we care is that <laughs> the first stars actually would form in those very little halos, a million solar masses. So. Uh, our prevailing ideas on the formation of the first stars uh, would dramatically be altered if uh, dark matter ended up being warm. And now that's a problem and an opportunity because, you know, since we don't know for sure, it means that our predictions could be about the first stars could be wrong. It's an opportunity because if 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 we see that the predictions are not verified, it could become even a, a, a test on the type of dark matter that we have. Okay, well that, that's an important distinction. Now I want to get to the stars here in just a minute, but I've got a relevant comment from Hugo Burnham who's asking uh, on the Q&A app, what is the largest redshift we can observe from Earth? And presumably it would be what you were talking about with the CMB, correct? So yes, in terms of uh, the, 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 the most distant redshift where we can see a, a light signature is the 1300. Uh, if you, if we were able to observe uh, neutrinos uh, much better than we can now, we would actually be able uh, to see neutrinos from uh, a little bit of a higher redshift. <laughs> and uh, oh, so, kind of... and uh, if we were able to observe gravitational waves a lot better than we can do now, then we would even be able to probe. Uh, 
perhaps even down to the inflationary period. But yeah, that so was it, that was big really, news last year. Yeah, so it really depends on what it is that. Well, the the news last year was a constraint on gravitational waves coming from the cosmic microwave background, but in principle, you could imagine building something that would let you see the relics of those waves directly. I mean, yeah. it's extremely difficult. But. Cool. That's great. So thank you, Hugo. Good question. Okay, so so you've set the stage for us. The you, You've told us the importance between the cold dark matter and the warm dark matter and the formation of the structures that may have brought the first stars uh, into being. Um, what's next? What's the next stage? So, what, so in those little halos, the, lo the little grainy structures in the cold dark matter image, uh, gas falls in, cools down, and uh, at a redshift of around 50, 55, so you're talking about 40, 50 million years um, of age for the universe, so very early on, you would form the first uh, population three stars. These are, these are first the first stars. These are extremely rare objects. And the second simulation actually gives a little bit of a of an, an indication of, uh, of what would happen in one of these halos. If we okay, could, so, if Scott, we could. so while Scott pulls that up, let me just uh, summarize what I think. So we've got a universe that's got either cold or warm dark matter and a lot of hydrogen, right? Yeah, and I'm assuming cold for the for, because that's the prevailing assumption and we know a little bit less of what would happen with the warm. Sure, sure. And uh, so we've got all this hydrogen swirling around and being attracted by uh, by gravity and presumably influenced by the dark matter around it. So here, here he goes. Okay. So go ahead. So uh, I'm not seeing the simulation yet. Click on his uh, thumbnail. It might come up. I can see it. I can see it. Okay. It's hard to comment. So, so as the as the this is gas now. As gas collapses, it forms little dense knots. As those knots form uh, these very massive first stars, and then these massive first stars explode, producing the little supernova explosion. Pretty soon, in the bright knot that we see now, we'll have another explosion. I think coming up. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yep. There it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so it shows the formation of a, of a small, and then you see the supernova remnant uh, blowing up. So, so these uh, these stars, um, the first stars, are very unusual. Uh, most of the most of the um, of the of the stars that we know about uh, in the in the local universe are actually uh, have a chemical composition that includes other elements beyond uh, hydrogen and helium. Uh, astronomers call everything heavier than helium metals. <laughs> yeah, I always thought that but, was weird. <laughs> uh, yeah, which, uh, you know, I, I'm assuming with the disapproval of uh, every everybody with a chemistry degree. But <laughs> anyway, uh, so the local stars have metals. Some have more, some have less, but they all have some. The one of the things that happened in the early universe is the nu is the primordial nucleosynthesis. This is when the nuclei of atoms are formed. But the primordial nucleosynthesis forms helium in very small traces of other elements. Very very little lithium, very little deuterium, not much at all. So most of the elements that we see around us today are made in stars. But it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg. Ooh, ooh. And since all the stars we see have some metals, who made those metals? Well, mm -hmm. the previous generation of stars. And if you push it a little bit, you get to the first generation of stars. So there must have been a generation of stars that formed from the material that came out of the Big Bang with the primordial composition and made the first elements. Because they were so different in composition than present-day stars, we think that those objects would be much more massive, they would be much hotter, they would live uh, uh, shorter lives, and they would end their lives with uh, gigantic supernova explosions. Great, that's, that was a great summary. So because, and that's primarily just due to the fact that they're they're 
they coalesce from these big bigger clumps at the beginning of the universe. They, they were... form from bigger clumps, and because they don't have a lot of metals, and because there are no structures around that make them spin, we think that they would probably not be able to fragment into a multitude of smaller stars, and so they would just form single, unusually large stars. Oh, that's interesting. I never thought about the effect of spin on these things. I guess it would. And, I guess it would make a difference. And the other effect is that we know that stars have winds; uh, they lose material in the in the outskirts, and those mm -hmm. winds. Uh, are large because of their chemical composition. If you remove, essentially, radiation pushes on the metals in their atmospheres. So if you remove the metals, the winds are much less strong, and so the star retains a larger fraction of its mass, and this enables it to 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 undergo a much more violent supernova explosion. In fact, it's a, an explosion that we call a pair instability supernova. I love that. I, love, I, I, I like saying it. It makes me feel smart when I do. The star is so hot that uh, in its atmosphere, uh, it forms little pairs of electrons and positrons. So it forms little amounts of, of antimatter. And those two uh, tend to, uh, so when you form, since it takes a lot of energy to form a little bit of matter, when you form these uh, uh, electron-positron pairs, you remove a lot of energy from, from the radiation field of the star. And that radiation is what's fighting gravity. It's what's keeping gravity, you know, compensating gravity for these massive stars. So uh, when you do that, when you remove that energy, the star tends to collapse and become even hotter. Uh, but then, since it's hotter, it will form even more of this electron-positron pair. So it will get even more, collapse even more and get even hotter. <laughs> and so, uh, as you can imagine, this doesn't end well. No. <laughs> And uh, and we think that these pair instability supernova explosions destroy completely the star, and you are looking at explosions that are you know potentially hundreds of times brighter than the, the 1987A supernova. Right, which was relatively close by compared. So, <laughs> so so with a with a telescope with infrared sensitivity like the James Webb Space Telescope, you would uh, be you able it. you would be able to see these objects uh, essentially anywhere in the universe. Okay, so let me let me back up just a second. These first stars, they were bigger than most of the, most of the stars we see today. They are hotter, they didn't live as longer as long and when they died, they died in these spectacular it is believed supernova explosions, some of which could be called uh, pair instability supernovae. Yeah, it depends um, on the mass of the star. But. Exactly. So let me ask you this, has we since these supernovae are so bright, has Hubble been able to see any of this? Is, is, are there any observations of these first uh, so supernovae? Occasionally, there are rumors about a pair instability supernova being observed. Uh, this is always a very debated issue. In principle, a, a star in the in, in the universe around us uh, should not form such a supernova because even starting with a very massive stars, since it has a chemical composition and is different from primordial, it will lose a lot of mass. So the core of the star, when the star is ready to go supernova, is just not massive enough to make a pair instability. Uh -huh. Of course, you know, uh, as they say, where there is a will, <laughs> you know, if you imagine a pair of these stars, each does its own evolution and they merge at the end, Merging them could be a way to exceed the mass threshold and have a pair instability even in something that didn't have any right to go pair instability. So uh -huh. we don't know for sure. There may be ways to make pair instability supernova in the local universe, but certainly it's not the preferred uh, mechanism. And if it happens at all, it's pretty rare. Okay, and how would you know that you're looking at it? You'd, you would, are there any characteristics that make it different? One of the characteristics is that this supernovae would remain bright for a very long time. Okay. So they would be, they would have, you know, the, the, the variation of luminosity with time, we call it a light curve, and they have a very flat light curve. So that would be an indication. And then another indication would be looking at the material um, 
the, the chemical composition of what's left over. Okay, uh, so you, what the what, so what he was talking about as far as the light curve goes is brightness versus time, and a lot of supernovae are very bright and then they go down pretty quickly yeah. with time. Some he's saying that they would be a little bit long, they'd be bright for a very long time, and we, that's one way we would know that you're looking at a pair of instability supernova. So that's really great. Um, if you want to learn, so Massimo actually helped me make a video on this a, a couple of years ago. Uh, it's called First Light. If you do a search on our YouTube channel, you'll see it. And we talk about pair of instability supernovas in there. Uh, so I uh, would encourage you to work on that. Massimo was instrumental in getting that script, or helping me write that script. So I want to give a shout out to that. Okay, so any, so those are the stars, the first stars in the universe. Uh, what about the galaxies? How how much longer do we have to wait for galaxies so, to form now? So there is where Hubble has, uh, uh, and the Cosmic microwave, microwave Background Experiments have helped a lot because Hubble has pushed the frontier to to high redshift. Now we see galaxies with reasonable confidence up to redshift 9. There are some claims of redshift 10 objects. And uh, so we know that there are galaxies, uh, redshift 10, it's uh, 380 million years of age, just to give a reference. Yeah. So, so we can go uh, well within the first, uh, the first billion year, in fact, within the first half a billion year of the universe. Uh, at some point before redshift 10, uh, the first galaxies must have formed. According to the prevailing models, and again, this is all predicated assuming that we know that dark matter is cold. If it's okay. not, you know, almost everything I said uh, needs to be either corrected or, or is just wrong. Uh, but anyway, in the cold dark matter, uh, we expect that the first galaxies will actually uh, form from parts of space that have already been uh, polluted in, uh, in metals by the, su the first supernovae. So several generations of stars will have come uh, yeah, and gone. Uh, yeah, one or two. And so the first galaxies that we see, we expect them to be not made of primordial galaxies, or primordial stars, but made of stars that are low metallicity but have some metal content. So the composition would be somewhat intermediate from the from the lowest metallicity stars we see around us and the, and the primordial, because they would have been, uh, you know, the supernova explosions spread a lot of uh, a lot of material around, and. Uh, just for reference, I, I believe that uh, the 1987A supernova released the 0 0.07 solar masses of iron, of nickel, okay. uh, that, that decays. And uh, the type of supernova that I'm describing would release 130 solar masses. Wow. So, uh, so that's a much more serious amount of metals. So a that lot, gets. and we're thinking about the mass of the sun and hundreds amount of just one element. Yeah, that, yeah. So you can imagine lot. that if in a large cloud you have even one supernova, it will produce enough metals to pollute the whole cloud, and then the next generation of stars will form somewhat differently. So we expect these galaxies to be low metallicity, but, but to to have some metals. How do we verify that that's true? That's one area where Hubble is actually helping JWST observations. Uh, JWST, these objects are very faint, the first generation of galaxies. Now, you could be um, pragmatic and say, you know, whatever, whatever object I see at the highest redshift, I call it the first galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but if you want to have a, a, you know, a little bit of a more thought out definition, you really want to observe these, these objects that are the first galaxy sized structures forming. And we expect them to be faint even for James Webb. Right, and, it, and you're talking now, folks, he's talking they're so faint, he's talking about the, if you look at the ultra deep field, the red dots in there are what are the, are the kinds of galaxies he's talking about. Very small, very faint. So yeah, yeah these are very these difficult. Are fainter, and these are these are going to be extremely. I just want to inter interject that these are very difficult to discover, and then the verification, which you're talking about, yeah. is really not easy. It's so. I mean, yeah, they're be pretty clever. Yeah, but the red dots you see in the ultra deep field are things that are re reasonably easy for JWST. 
<laughs> I'm talking about the I red knew dots. I was going to say that. <laughs> the red dots that you don't see in the apple. Yes. <laughs> so, and, and, the, and, the, and the thing that Hubble has done recently uh, is to look at the frontiers field. Look at a bunch of clusters of galaxies that are natural telescopes, natural gravitational lenses that amplify the objects behind them. And, uh, and having well characterized gravitational lenses is going to be extremely helpful because you would want to combine JWST with those lenses to really get to the faintest objects that you could possibly observe. Wow, that, would, so that it, really would be the absolute first galaxy. I mean, that would be amazing. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's, the, that's the idea. Um, so what were these galaxies like? Presumably they were full of the Earth, some um, among the earliest stars, maybe not the first generation, like you said. They've been through, uh, there's some metals in there. But they're still pretty big, pretty hot, and they no, die they, pretty quickly, right? Or am I, are we, have we calmed down a little bit in, in the it, stars? Yeah, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't take uh, a lot of metals to, uh, to, to help these uh, clouds from which the stars form fragment. And so we expect that, that those already at the second generation of stars, you will have uh, somewhat a more normal mass distribution, some massive and some smaller ones. And in fact, some might even be sufficiently small to leave uh, you know, the, the billions of years that are needed to have them survive to the present time. Of course, the problem is that if you have uh, you know, a handful, say, a thousand of these stars in the Milky Way, it would not be easy to find them. Okay. But uh, but we could have some of those that are that have remained, you know, from those days. So tell us a little bit. Oh, <laughs> I have to read this. Hugo Burnham is saying, "I'm looking for the red dots. I can't see in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, but struggling to see them." That's because. <laughs> Yeah, some of them aren't there or yeah. not observable. <laughs> I'm looking for the red dots I can't see, but yeah. struggling. That was pretty good. I like that. Thanks. Um, so, um, so tell us a little bit about the galaxy shapes. Are they were they markedly different from the galaxies of today? Or are they more or less the same? Were they spirals or what about the sizes well, of these things? Well, we we expect them to be pretty regular. Uh, so, in terms of mass, uh, you're looking at things that are that have a mass uh, lower than the lowest companions of the Milky Way, than the smallest companions of the Milky Way. So these are very small galaxies, and they are probably just irregular fuzz uh, in those stages. Certainly there is, there is no time or, or way to form uh, a, a, anything like a spiral structure. Right. A spiral structure needs a, a, a well-defined disk. Uh, to form, and uh, and this requires a very a nice, well-established rotation pattern in the galaxy, uh, and uh, and these objects will probably have a lot of irregular motions. You can imagine the kind of things that we were seeing at at the end of the first movie. They are still accreting matter from filaments. They are very regular. Yeah, so they so they're kind of clumpy, not really well defined shapes at all. And yeah, yeah. what about the number of stars? Are they smaller, more or less? Yeah, some of these would start with very few, very few stars. Okay. And uh, see, I guess. And uh, even in the in the ultra deep field, we see as we go to higher redshift, the Hubble ultra deep field, that you have more. You see less and less regular objects, and more and more of those objects that you know people refer to as train wrecks. <laughs> so we see that tendency to more irregular shapes, even even uh, after you know one billion years after in the right. in the more recent universe. So I would imagine that the train wreck type of object would become dominant uh, at earlier times. Okay, you've you've touched on this already, but I want to bring it. I'll bring it back up again, so we can we can focus on uh, on the spacecraft on JWST. But uh, you've mentioned already that that Hubble, uh, through surveys like the Frontier Fields, where we're looking at these deep fields that are being gravitationally lensed, that are giving Hubble a little bit more of an insight than it would ordinarily get because it's using the help of the gravity uh, gravitational lenses. Um, but we are, and so we we've 
taken our first steps into this science and into getting more observations to sort of back up with some of the models that you're working with, give us a glimpse of what your hopes are for JWST in this field when it launches in October 2018. What, yeah. what are you but, hoping to see? So let me say, first of all, that uh, what's limiting Hubble is not so much its size, but its temperature. So oh, okay. Hubble, uh, initially, the Ultra DFI was done with the advanced camera. It was a visible light instrument. And so if you look at objects that are distant enough that their light gets redshifted in the infrared, it's not a matter of sensitivity. It's a matter that you are just you know, blind to that light. Okay, good. But when Wi-Fi Camera 3 was installed, Hubble gained significant sensitivity to some near-infrared wavelengths. And that's what allowed Hubble to push from Redshift 6 to Redshift 9. It, it, uh, it, the ultra deep field in the infrared is not, doesn't represent more exposures than the ultra deep field in the visible. It's just exposure with a, an infrared-sensitive camera. So if you could add an instrument to Hubble that goes to even longer wavelengths, he could see some, uh, some objects at higher redshift. The problem is that Hubble, the, the primary mirror of Hubble, is, uh, is at an ambient temperature. Ah. Uh, and so he, he, even if you built an instrument for going to this infrared wavelength, the, the mirror itself would be glowing red hot for, from the point of view of that instrument. So the background would be so high that you wouldn't be able to see. So Hubble is designed as a great imaging instrument but for visible or near infrared wavelengths. And so the, the, the advantage of JWST is not only that it's bigger but also that it's cold and so it can observe at these longer wavelengths. I was so, also going to point out that Hubble um, is sensitive in the ultraviolet and one of the things that's interesting about that in the 2014 release of the Hubble Deep Field with the UV channel is that you'd see a lot of galaxies with a lot of star formation and then when you think about that being red shifted um, that information is pretty important to understand that process is when you kind, kind of look at those galaxies closer so that when you go to JWST you can say, oh, we've seen this stuff with Hubble at high resolution in the ultraviolet and the visible and now we can see stuff in the infrared and we might have a clue how those galaxies work. Yeah, that or is correct. If, if they're different from the galaxies that we analyzed already. Yeah, that is correct. And the other point is that some of the best fields for JWST to observe are the Hubble fields. The reason is that when you go to objects that are this faint, you tend to use just imaging data to select them at least. And, uh, and so you may have interlopers, things that look like a high redshift galaxy but are just maybe a little red dust reddened local galaxy something that has the color of a high redshift galaxy but is not at high redshift. So having the Hubble data for, for these type of objects would be extremely useful because if you, if you see anything with Hubble it means that it wasn't at that high redshift. So it would complement the, the selection with JWST by vetting the objects. Oh, that's a good, that's a good point. Okay, well let me, uh, um, so uh, Tell us a little bit more about, um, so JWST will be cooler, it'll, it'll uh, be, have a much larger mirror, uh, so you'll be able to actually see, you're pretty confident that you'll be able to see these first galaxies and even stars, correct? Well, the first stars, uh, it's very difficult. We, we could have indirect evidence or we could see their supernovae, uh, but even a, a very luminous star, it's too faint for JWST. Okay. Uh, the first the galaxy, the pair, but but maybe not the pair instability supernovae. Yeah, no, we okay. we have enough sensitivity to see the pair instability supernovae, and then uh, the game be, is related to how rare they are, and uh, and so one would need to do a search. Okay. But the, the the first galaxies, uh, at least as interpreted as objects at redshift earlier than than 10, uh, bigger than 10. So within the first 
few hundred million years of the universe, I'm pretty confident that we will see them because uh, there is evidence from the cosmic microwave background experiments that uh, there was something at those redshifts that was emitting ultraviolet radiation. The reason is that with these experiments you get essentially an integrated view along uh, in the universe that crosses all the times from now to the to the era of recombination to this redshift 1300 when matter becomes roughly speaking neutral and uh, and those experiments are sensitive to how many electrons you have in along your line of sight from here to the 1300 and it, they can provide an, a, a measurement of how many electrons you have and if you have electrons it means that some UV radiation ionized hydrogen to produce those electrons so uh, it actually provides a constraint that is not very specific but it's statistical that says you know you had output of ionizing radiation uh, at redshift greater than nine or ten, that's the that's the the type of indication that we get. So we know statistically that there are galaxies. You know, I, I hate to say maybe statistically because people have a negative reaction to that, but <laughs> there is evidence from the electrons that there are galaxies at redshift greater than than nine, producing these ionizing radiation. Cool. And so uh, we should be, be well positioned to see that. Good. Okay. Well, let me get to some comments because we've got quite a few on the uh, on the Q and A app. Daniel Nasato from the Q and A app is asking, "What would be emitting the light that we would see beyond the CMB redshift mentioned before, before or during inflation?" I think he's asking, "What would the wavelengths be beyond the CMB?" Yeah, we wouldn't be seeing any light. We we would have to use to study things happening before the CMB uh, is released, we would need to use other uh, sources of information like neutrinos or gravitational waves right. and light. Right, because it was so dense, light actually wasn't able to shoot yeah. you know, right. deeply yeah. from it. Yes. Okay, so and no we'll, light, we'll have a no hangout light. on that. No we light. should have a hangout on that part part of the universe as well, because that's an interesting time. Yeah. To be clear, no to light it. means no light, no infrared radiation, no radio waves, you know, nothing electromagnetic. Yes. Okay, Adam Synergy is commenting, uh, Hubble 25th makes me feel really old. Uh, tell me about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Tony, shall I send my 25-page list of suggestions for hangouts to you or Carol? Uh, yes. <laughs> send them to both of us. Uh, but, yeah, we, if you've got some, uh, just, you know, I can I can I'll PM you my uh, uh, email address and you just send them to me. I, or if there's a gift package involved, you can send it to me. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, in fact, uh, if I can chime in, uh, Tony, yeah. I remember, you know, I was actually an, already an active astronomer before Hubble launched, and I remember some colleagues claiming to see 30th magnitude galaxies. Uh, with other telescopes, and uh, these are the faintest objects that you can right. see in the alternative field, and uh, and somehow those claims disappeared after the <laughs> uh, after Hubble was launched. Oh, yeah, I wonder why. Yeah, they were getting called on it. Okay, evidence um, does a lot of things, doesn't it? Yes. Bob Harkins is asking: uh, Do the very large Population Three stars, when they go supernova? create black holes? Um, so, of course, this is model dependent because we have never seen one, but we think that the pair instability supernova uh, actually leaves no remnant. Everything is, uh, is dispersed. Wow. Uh, for certain masses, they would uh, uh, produce um, a black hole. Essentially, it all depends uh, going through the process that I described where it gets denser and denser and hotter and hotter, it's a race between uh, gravity and radiation. So the whole issue is whether it bounces or not. Does it get to a point that is so dense that it manages to bounce or does it keep going? If it keeps going, it forms a black hole and, and very little matter and metals are released if it 
bounces, it, it explodes. And there may be even masses where it actually oscillates a little bit before going either way. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, so probably the first stars will do both, both form black holes and do the pair instabilities, but depending on their ma specific mass. Awesome. Good question. That was really good. Um, this is from somebody that has uh, characters I can't read from the Q&A app uh, asking, hello, are there any other means of discovering the first galaxies, etc., than the almighty JWST? Uh, perhaps some plans for some far future telescope. Um, so I guess... <laughs> so JWST is up on deck next, but there's also W first and the High Def Space Telescope. Will that give yeah. us better? Those are further down the road, right? Yeah. So for instance, the uh, there could be a nice synergy with W first because the pairing stability supernovae may and, and the first stars may be very rare. So it may be impractical for JWST to look for them because it would take a lot of time with JWST, the field of view of JWST. Uh, with an overlap with W first, W first has a large field of view and at least at the, at the rest is where it will be sensitive. The, uh, w first is sensitive enough to see the, the, the pairing stability supernovae just because they are so bright. So W first could identify them as little red blips and then JWST could steer and take the additional data uh, to confirm that it's really a pairing stability supernova and so on. Right. So that is, a, that is a synergy. I could imagine another synergy for radio experiments looking at what we call the 21 centimeter radiation experiments like LOFAR that are ongoing to study the, the, this early universe because they would again provide a different indications of possible areas where JWST could look for the first galaxies and uh, the high definition space telescope is uh, is bigger and so that helps because it gives you high resolution and, and more sensitivity it all depends on whether it will be designed to have sensitivity at the infrared wavelengths of JWST Right. Otherwise, so you would be in the same position as Hubble. It would have the sensitivity, but it wouldn't have the right wavelength coverage. Right. So the uh, so we're looking at W first in twenty in the twenty twenties, and I guess a high def uh, in the decades following that. So we've got a lot of exciting stuff coming up, uh, all of which will contribute to the science. Uh, Hugo Burnham is asking Massimo, taking into account the current shape of the universe which I guess is flat. If we keep looking up, would we... <laughs> I would think it was a good shape. But, uh, <laughs> if we keep looking up, would we actually end up looking down? <laughs> okay, that's... Well, that's... Uh, that was, Hugo, are, are you being a smart aleck? Yeah, he's being he's a smart aleck. Smart aleck. <laughs> there is also, actually, that's my job. That's what I'm here there for. There is actually you don't a steal my job. serious angle to the question. Uh, there were people that were uh, asking themselves what is what we call the topology of the universe. Yeah, that is, when you think about the universe, you think of the universe as a, you know as a sphere or a giant sphere or cube or something, but it could be a torus, like a donut. Right. So if the universe had the shape of the donut. And you and you look along the axis, you could conceivably um, look at a fool looking in the opposite direction from the back. Yeah. And then cosmic Homer would be very happy. Yeah. Right. Because but, donuts. But we <laughs> a few people have tried experiments to to constrain statistically. That's the only thing we can do now. The topology of the universe, and they've come out empty-ended. There is no evidence that that there is any repetition in the number of objects we see. Okay, I got one more uh, from uh, Argentina on uh, YouTube. Uh, does and I'll, this is I, I, this is an interesting, interesting question? Does dark matter change over time? In other words, does it lose energy or mass? And does the only way is the only way to see dark matter is it at a cosmic scale? So there's two questions there. Does dark matter change over time, and how do we see dark matter? Yes, some uh, the, the the sort of embarrassing point is that we don't know what dark matter is, even though <laughs> yeah, that's uh, a bit of a sticking point. Most of the matter in the universe, uh, you know, it's only made better by the fact that we don't know what dark energy is, and that's the biggest energy density in the universe. But uh, so, in principle, many of the dark matter candidates are particles. 
that you could in principle produce in, a, in accelerators. And so that would be one avenue where you actually see the dark matter candidate in the lab. And other, other candidates are actually unstable over very long time scales. They don't decay immediately, but over cosmic time scales they would decay. So dark matter would actually be evolving because a little bit at a time it would disappear and we would be able to detect uh, the energy released when, when it decays. And in fact there are already in the, in, the, in the scientific literature some claims of these detections. This, the, the issue is still debated, no, no claim I, has been uh, accepted, no, but there are claims. That of detection of decaying dark matter from, you know, the, the best way, the best places to look at it would be the centers of massive clusters of galaxies or our own galaxy where you expect a lot of dark matter and so you have a, a bigger signal for, signature for the annihilation. So how do you, so how do we see this stuff? What's the best way of, I mean, I've seen dark matter maps. They've made maps. So how, yeah, how okay. do you know? So the, the dark matter annihilation, some of the claims, for instance, are based on, the, on Fermi. You use X-ray or gamma ray satellites. So uh, people have looked at Chandra data or Fermi data trying to, to find that. Okay. The dark matter that we constrain, was its existence has been discovered thanks to its gravitational effect. Yeah, Scott's showing use, an animation now of yeah. gravitational lensing and stuff and, too. And we can use gravity to uh, to produce a dark matter map, as you say. And uh, the technique that we use is less, uh, uh, you know, beautiful than the strong lensing that you see in clusters of galaxies, where you have these gravitational arcs. And it's called weak lensing. Weak lensing uh, is. Uh, is essentially the fact that the, that the dark matter will make, will tilt ever so slightly galaxies uh, from the position that they would normally have and would maybe squeeze them a little bit, makes them a little bit more flattened. So, uh, so that allows you to track the distribution of matter if you know uh, the, the properties of galaxies. Again, this is a very difficult experiment. It's uh, it's also, um, again, I would have to invoke the, the word statistics because you cannot <laughs> you really do really don't like doing that, do you? <laughs> uh, because a single gravitational arc has a lot of information by its own. Right. With lensing, you need to look at millions of galaxies. And W first would actually be able to do this type of science. It's one of the primary reasons why it's built, to look at weak lensing. Awesome. Okay. Well, let me let me. Let, we're out of time. Let's go ahead and stop there, Massimo. I want to thank you very much for well, taking the time out for the opportunity. to explain this. And, and you guys were great uh, with all of your questions. Thanks for thanks for uh, giving us so many great uh, questions and, and comments. We appreciate you doing that. Uh, if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, Hubble Site Channel on YouTube, you should you need to do that. Follow us on Twitter at Hubble Telescope. And oh, don't forget. Hubble25th.org. If you've got any suggestions or uh, ideas for future Hangouts this year, please uh, tweet your ideas out using the Hubble Hangout hashtag or Hubble25 or whatever, uh, and we will. I'll be looking at those, and Carol and I would definitely take them into account. Speaking of which, uh, Carol, I don't recall what we're doing next week. Do we have? Have we? We haven't finalized next week's Hangout, have we? We yes, we have. We have. What is it? Um, okay. <laughs> oh, you didn't get that memo, Tony? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently he didn't, even though I did send it to him. Yeah. Um, uh, and Elena got it, too. Um, uh. the, Andrew Fox, who is from the Space Telescope, oh, right, right, right. recently did a, um, a press release at the American Astronomical Society where they have looked at the Milky Way galaxy and they have detected these bubbles that are coming out from the galaxy um, and it's a very clever technique and he's going to talk about that and perhaps uh, one of his colleagues will join us as well. Great, you're right. I did get the I did get that memo <laughs> and my, I'm all I'm all foggy from from last week still. So yes, yeah, so please join us next week. Same bat time, same. Bat, oh, I should say Hubble time, same Hubble channel. Uh, next week, Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern time. 
That's right. it for this week's fight. That's, that's it for this week, everybody. Is it for uh, you to say? Yeah. <laughs> Almost at Space Fans again. Bye bye. <laughs> okay. Right. Thank Thanks, you, Massimo. 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 And thank you guys for watching. And as always, keep, keep looking, looking up. up. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the brand new 2015 season of the Hubble Hangouts. Uh, my name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and we are back from our meetings and all of our other stuff, and this is our first back to our normally scheduled hangout, and so we're, we're glad you're back. We hope you had good, good holidays and got all that out of your system, and Carol and I just got back from the... Uh, uh, 225th meeting of the American Astronomical Society and Carol do you know that we did 11 hangouts in like four days or something like that. It was like that crazy. was exhausting. It was amazing though. Yeah so we're still kind of decompressing from all of that but we have a great hangout plan for you today. We have uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Massimo Stiavelli. He's the JWST mission head at the Space Telescope Science Institute and he is going to tell us a lot about the early universe, the first stars, the first galaxies and uh, and we're going to learn all about what this, this sort of interesting time in, in the history of the universe was like and so uh, we'll, but before we get to the discussion let me uh, welcome, let me say hi to Scott. Scott, Happy New Year! Happy New Year Tony, it's how good are you? See, it's good to see you again, I'm glad you're back. So, good to see you too. Good, so um, one of the things that 2015 is bringing in for us is it marks the 25th anniversary, and I'm sure you've heard us say this already, of the Hubble Space Telescope being in orbit, 25 years. And so throughout the year, uh, we at the Institute have got a lot of different things planned, a lot of content we're going to be creating, some special hangouts we're going to be doing. But if you want to follow... Hey, <laughs> Good. So you tell us a little bit about... Uh, so, uh, one of your big research interests, and one of the things I love talking with you about, is this period in the early universe uh, where first stars and galaxies formed. Give us some idea. Can you tell us, first of all, what do we mean when we're, is there a specific range of dates or times when we say the early universe, or is it just a very nebulous concept? What is the early universe? So to speak. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit of... <laughs> oh, I was punny right there. I didn't... Yeah, you were. You were punny. Oh, I didn't even didn't notice. Know. I didn't even it's notice. It's a little bit nebulous. Um, <laughs> you know, some people would split it between the very early universe and the early universe even. But roughly speaking, uh, as you go back in time, uh, you get to the point where the universe looks very different from what looks around us today and you know how very different is a, a little bit of a matter of personal taste but uh, roughly speaking I would say if you get to a point where you don't have any galaxy around uh, you could call it early universe and uh, before that time you have a number of events you know you have the formation of the first stars you have uh, a number of phenomena that you know happen very early after the Big Bang including you know that rapid expansion of the universe that uh, we call inflation. Uh, so the, the essentially inflation to the formation of the first stars could of the first galaxies could be a good definition of early universe. Okay. Uh, the um, so you, I want to one of the reasons, and this is a hard question for me to ask in a way that <laughs> follow along on what what is going to be planned and where it's going to be and when and all of that kind of stuff. We have set up a website. It's called Hubble25th.org. Don't forget the th part. That's that's important. It's H-U-B-B-L-E-2-5-T-H dot O-R-G. So we hope you'll visit that site. That's where we're going to post all the, that'll be the centerpiece around which all, we, we make sure all the information gets disseminated and put out to people. So we hope you'll check that website out and let us know if, um, if you have any uh, uh, comments or questions or things like that. Now, one of the things I wanted to do, Carol and I are currently putting together the list of Hangouts for this year, and I would like to call, uh, shout out to you guys. Let us know if you've got any ideas for Hangouts you would like to see in the coming year so that Carol and I can take that into, into consideration when we, uh, when we do the scheduling, because we'd like to hear from you. We want to make sure that you're getting the most out of these Hangouts as possible. So if you tweet out your ideas using the Hubble Hangout hashtag, uh, we will see it, and Carol and I will talk about it and see if we can make it happen for you. So we hope you'll do that. Which brings me to, finally, interacting with us on this Hangout. Hubble Hangout hashtag, that's the easiest way. You can tweet on that. Uh, you also 
can uh, leave us questions and comments at the Q&A app. I'm already seeing a couple here. You can also leave some comments on the YouTube page, and we're monitoring all of that, and we'll bring them up as the uh, as the conversation progresses, and if it's relevant to what Massimo is talking about, I will uh, I'll bring it up. So, without any more ado, let's get started. With me today, as I said, is Dr. Massimo Stiavelli. He's the JWST Mission Head. Hi, Massimo. Welcome, and thanks for coming. Greetings, everyone. My pleasure. Would make any sense, but what I'm trying to get at is, how is it that we can see back in time? Do you understand the question? How is it that when we look at the, when we look up with powerful telescopes in space, we're actually seeing these these pa this past period of the universe? What makes that possible? Well, that's uh, it's the combination of the huge size of the universe and the finite speed of light. You know, when I look around in my room uh, or even across the street from the window, I don't notice that the, the, the speed of light is finite because the distance is very small. But in fact, when I see somebody walking down the stairs in the building in front of me, uh, you know, I'm not seeing them now. I'm seeing them, you know, some microseconds or fraction of a microseconds ago when they were going down the stairs. So the difference is not important uh, for many part practical purposes. But once you go uh, and look at galaxies and this more and more distant galaxies, their distance is so large that the travel, the light travel time is actually important. And so you, you see these objects uh, in the past. We see the sun as it was eight minutes ago. And uh, and we see you know the nearest big galaxy uh, as it was uh, you know two million years ago and 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 it gets uh, more and more remote as we go to more distant objects. I, that that to me has always been a great consequence of the finite speed of light. I mean it's one of the things that the universe is so large and it's been around for so long that you know we keep seeing um, uh, further back uh, the the. the dimmer the objects are, the further away they are, the, the further back in time we are seeing them because it took, it took a certain amount of time for that light to get here. Now, do, how does, let's talk a little bit about the size of the universe. You mentioned already there was a period where the universe went through a rapid expansion. I'm presuming you're talking about inflation at that point, but yes. this is a period after inflation that, we're, that you're interested in, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so the universe we all know is expanding and it's accelerating as it does so, uh, which implies that it's been in the past. It has been smaller. So in this period that we're talking about, this early universe period, how big was the universe roughly? Well, the um, there are two sides to that question. One is that we don't really know how large the universe is because we have a horizon. We have and the horizon is set by what is the most distant point in the or sphere in the universe that is distant enough and still allows enough time for light to get to us. Uh, there could be parts that are even more distant than, than that, and we that's just the observable. Have an, the yeah, and that's the observable universe. Mm -hmm. So uh, what happens beyond that can be defined by mathematical models, but is not observable. Uh, we think that inflation uh, will actually grow the universe